Hi, this is Rob Packard from Medical Device Academy, and today I'm doing a short video with one of our brand new summer interns. Her name is Shivani Nachani. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Um, this you. is actually a training video that one of our customers uh, that Shivani is working for has asked us to create for them to explain the difference between intended use indications for use and intended purpose. And the way this came about is the company has been in business for quite some time. They have products on the market, but when they were going through their renewal of their CE marking, they noticed that they don't have intended purpose in any of their labeling. So they wanted instructions written for them on how to define the intended purpose. And since we always have confusion over what is the difference between intended use and indication for use, I said, hey, this is a great opportunity to also include intended purpose and put all three into one video. So in this uh, slide that we have here, we have two different images. The top image is showing how you would measure flow of liquids through any kind of a vessel, whether it's a tubing or it's a artery or it's a vein. It's that's actually how they measure blood or measure blood flow in a surgery. They measure it also for hemodialysis, but they also use it in industry. So if you're trying to measure any kind of flow of like gasoline or uh, some sort of liquid through a pipe, like a water pipe, this is how non-invasively without going, putting a probe into the pipe, they can actually measure the flow through it. And they use ultrasonics to do that in calculations. So that's just an image showing general measurement of flow through a pipe or some sort of vessel. The second image though, shows you specifically we're measuring flow of blood with a probe invasively next to the heart. So this is a blood vessel feeding the heart. So this is heart surgery. They're measuring the flow before they close up the patient. So this is surgical, it's invasive. It's measuring a specific part of the body, cardiovascular surgery, the blood vessels feeding the heart. Totally different from intended use. Intended use is very general, doesn't even necessarily have to be medical device, but indications for use, it's very specific to the patient, the user, the environment of use, and what you're trying to treat. So what's intended purpose? Let me cover the others first for you. So the intended use, the term intended use is mentioned in the US regulations. It's mentioned in the European regulations, the new medical device regulations or MDR. It's also um, a generic high level term. According to the FDA, it's the general purpose of the device, but it's a broad function. It's not something that's detailed and you don't have to put it in your labeling you're not actually required to submit something that says, this is my intended use in a 510K submission or in CE marking submission. It's just what we mean is this is the general use. That's not what they're asking for. What they want in your labeling and in your submission is what are the indications for use? So that's the next slide. And in fact, if you read um, this, this part of the regulations, they define what indications for use is. And when you submit a 510K and it gets cleared, what they publish on the FDA website is a form letter saying you've been cleared. They also publish form 3881, which, defi which uh, defines your indication for use. If you also have a 510K summary, they'll include that and it will have a direct copy of that indication for use statement. It never shows the intended use. And the term indication for use, interestingly enough, is never used in the MDD or the MDR. So what do they use instead? They use the term intended purpose. In the MDD and in the MDR, the definition is identical. It hasn't ever changed between the old uh, uh, directives and the new regulations, there's no change. We've provided both references here, but the wording is identical. So intended Intended purpose can be used interchangeably with indication for use. It doesn't matter which one you use in your labeling, but 99% of the labels out there or instruction for use or device descriptions, you're going to find the words indication for use 
when you look at, look at what companies are providing. So that's the general word that you use, but it means the same thing as intended purpose in this context, given this definition. Now, hey. Shani. Thank you, Ram. So as Rob explained us the examples in the previous uh, definitions in the previous slides, let's move on to one of the examples. So um, one of the examples we have taken here is for fracture fixation. So it is from the FDA guidance. And uh, as you can see, the intended use, which is mentioned here, is bone fracture fixation. So here you can see they have not mentioned the location where it is going to be used, the environment of use, whether it's going to be sterile or whether it's going to be non-sterile. And uh, they have simply mentioned that it's going to be used for fracture, uh, fracture fixation. So you can see that um, on the left side, um, we have an image of a diaphyseal fracture. And on the right side, we have a picture of an ep epiphyseal fracture, which is at the end of the bone. And this is in the middle of the long bone. So um, you can see that in indications of use, they have given specifically that intended for bone, uh, that it is intended for bone fracture fixation of diaphyseal fracture in long bones. So it is basically only um, going to be used for a diaphyseal, as in in the middle of the in the middle of the long bone. So that is the difference between intended use and indications for use. It's more, it's giving you more details about where it is going to be used. But in case of intended use, it's just a broad, um, it's just a broad idea of what exactly the device is going to be used for. So that Perfect. is example. And and that's in the guidance document on substantial equivalence. And the yeah. best way to find guidance documents is not the FDA search tool. The best way to find guidance documents on the FDA website is to go into Google, type FDA guidance, and then your topic, in this case, substantial equivalence. Now we get a couple um, more examples. So this is similar to what we showed on the first slide, blood flow measurements. On the left-hand side, we have the example of a extracorporeal measurement. So if this was a hemodialysis system, you'd be measuring the blood flow through a tubing. So it's non-invasive, it's non-sterile, but it's still measuring blood flow. Whereas the example on the right is somebody that's trying to measure blood flow invasively during surgery on the heart of a blood vessel rather than through a tubing, and it's going to be sterile. So very different indications for use. So the, the intended use is blood flow, but the indication for use is much more specific. And you can see how these would be two totally different indications. There are also two different product codes if you look up on the FDA website. Here's another example, example three, and this is relevant to everybody right now. We're, we're just um, still in the COVID pandemic. And just recently, like in the last month, we had biofires first uh, was the first company to obtain approval from the FDA or clearance by the FDA for a diagnostic device to measure, um, to identify whether you have a COVID infection or not. But um, the first product that ever gets cleared for an IVD product can't go down the 510K pathway because the definition of the 510K pathway requires that you're equivalent to another device. And there's no other device that was approved for COVID. There were lots of emergency use approvals, but no regular clearance process that would be long-term. So the first one had to be approved through a de novo process. And that's what BioFire did. And this is a slight rewording of their indication for use. I took their name out of it. But it says a PCR-based multiplex nucleic acid test intended for qualitative detection, blah, blah, blah. You can see it's really specific. And you, you can't have the same device that's an IVD approved for H1N1 and SARS COVID-2 in, unless you have another device that was already cleared for those same indications. These two are very different. They're going to have different interferences, different false positives, false negatives, and they do look slightly different. They're, they're both in the same sort of family. They're both COVID viruses, but the, they're, um, that's only the, the, the high level characterization of the virus. When you really look at it, these are different strains and, and different 
animals completely. And so you have to develop a test specific to that strain. And now back to Shivani. Okay, moving on to um, talking about substantial equivalence. So what is substantial equivalence? So that's when uh, you have a predicate device for, um, you, have, you already have a predicate device for the device you're filing, and then it should have the same intended use or it should really have the same intended use and uh, indications for use. That is what it says in the FDA guidance. But then um, it really doesn't depend that, um, although your intended use is same, we always saw that the indications of use can differ. But then the, how does this really impact the substantial equivalence? It impacts due to uh, it impacts due to the risks associated with your device. So if the risks are the same for the new device, then it won't matter as much and then it will be a smooth pathway. But if there are different risks which are involved and uh, then you might not be able to prove the substantial equivalence for your new device. So that is the issue. That is one issue which comes up often with the new devices. So Rob, wanna pitch in here more on the risks associated with the new device and how does it affect the indications for use? Yeah, we had actually showed on a couple of these examples. I think this one's really strong for illustrating the difference. They're both doing the same thing. They're both measuring blood flow, but the risks are totally different. One is outside the body and it's non-sterile. The other one's inside the body and it's sterile. And if you looked at the risk classification for the MDR, because one is not touching the heart and the other one is touching the heart, one is gonna be a class three device and the other one's gonna be a class two A device. So very different regulatory pathway in Europe. There are two different product codes with the FDA and they're obviously different designs. They have different features associated with them, not to mention the manufacturing process is different. One is sterile, one's not. So one has to go through a sterilizer, but they both, work on the same principles, they're measuring blood flow by ultrasonics and doing um, uh, the same calculations, but they could be different sizes in different locations and one sterile, one's not. So they're very different. And that's those differences in risk are why the FDA says these can't be equivalent. Okay, um, so um, like there are additional risks which are getting added or it is like the risks are completely different, which is why we cannot prove the substantial equivalence, right? Okay. Now, the, our client had said, could you please create a training so we know how to document intended purpose? Well, the first lesson is you can use indication for use and intended purpose interchangeably but you need to make sure that in all of your labeling, so instruction for use, you use these four things. Best practices are indications for use, but that's not enough by itself. You also need the intended patient population, the intended users, because it could be self-use for a device. So it could be a, like an at-home over-the-counter product, or it could be a prescription only and I, the doctor trains you and then you use it at home or it could be used by a nurse or it could be used by a surgeon. So the intended user, the intended patient population, and then last but not least, the environment of use. Is it gonna be used in an OR? Is it gonna be used in an ambulance? Is it gonna be used in my home? Is it gonna be used in a loud environment or a quiet environment? Those, those could matter. And best practice would be to have each of those sections as a heading in your instruction for use and then explain each one concisely in a, in a sentence or two. And you wanna use the exact same wording. So copy and paste that information into your device description. So it's, it's necessary, actually required to have the exact same wording in both places. But this would be a complete indication. It doesn't give just the indication for use. It also gives what is the intended patient population, intended users and environment of use. And that gives you the complete indication for the device or the complete intended purpose of the device. And that's what you wanna be including, whether it's, and we actually have a, a template for our device description that was created using the FDA guidance, uh, the FDA RTA checklist and the European checklist for what they want to have in a technical file. So we made sure it had both requirements in there. You don't have to change any of the wording. 
Just use those four headings and have a concise sentence or two for each one. And that's the best practice for writing your instruction for use and copy that same wording right into your device description. Okay, don't forget to like, subscribe and share our video. Okay, thank you so much, Rob. And um, you can contact Rob as well. He is, um, he is uh, the director of Medical Device Academy and uh, he, is, he has 20 years of experience in the medical device industry. So if you're having any regulatory problems, just um, shoot an email to Rob or you can contact him on this, um, on the given number. Or you can also schedule a meeting with him on Calendly. Thank you. And one more thing. Uh, if you are looking for somebody that's a biomedical engineer, Shivani's at San Jose State University and she graduates in December. She's an intern working for us for this summer. Um, and if you're looking for somebody to hire, she'd be available at the end of December when she completes her master's degree. Thank you, Shivani. You did a great job. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank Bye -bye. you, Rob. Bye-bye.